Amtrak train 94 of the Continental left Washington Union Station at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time for Boston South Station. The train had 12 cars and was filled with travelers returning from the holiday season to their homes and schools for the second semester of the year. Two AEM-7 locomotives number 900 and 903 led the train. 903 was the lead locomotive. The engineer was 35-year-old Jerome Evans. After leaving Baltimore Penn Station, the train's next stop was Billington, Delaware, just north of Baltimore, while still in Baltimore County. The four-track northeast corridor narrows to two tracks at Gunpowder Interlocking just before crossing over the Gunpowder River. The train accelerated north towards that location. Ricky Lynn Gates, a Penn Central and Conrail engineer since 1973, was operating a trio of Conrail GE B36-7 locomotives, 5044, 5052, and 5045 light from Conrail's Bayview Yard just east of Baltimore, bound for Anola Yard near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Gates was later determined to have violated several signal and operating rules, including a failure to properly test his cab signals as required before departure from Bayview. It was later discovered that someone had disabled the cab signal alerter switch on lead unit 5044 with duct tape, muting it almost completely. Also, one of the light bulbs in the PR style cab system display had been removed. Investigators believe these conditions probably existed prior to departure from Bayview and that they would have been revealed by a properly performed departure test. Gates and his brakeman, Edward Butch Carmel, were also smoking cannabis cigarettes. Cannabis can alter one's sense of time and impair the ability to perform tasks that require concentration. Carmel was responsible for calling out the signals if Gates missed them, but failed to do so. As Amtrak Train 94 approached Gunpow interlocking near the Chase community on the electrified main line, the three Conrail freight locomotives were moving north on one of the adjacent freight tracks. Before the adjacent tracks reached the bridge at the river, they merged into two tracks that crossed the bridge. While the tracks and interlocking plant at this location are signalized to alert locomotive engineer when the interlocking switches are set for the through track train movement, the switches are not designed to derail a locomotive or train that runs through them when they are aligned for through track train movement. In case of the accident, the interlocking plan was properly set for the through track movement only, so as to allow the Amtrak train to pass the freight locomotives, which should have been stopped on the side tracks, on the through tracks, onto and over the bridge. The freight locomotive crew ignored the stop signals in their locomotive cab, which were muted, and at the track site, visible to them from the cab of the locomotive. Speed and a revent recorder devices indicated that Conrail locomotives were moving approximately 60 miles per hour when their brakes were applied for emergency stop after they had passed the track site signals. This was, Gates later claimed, when he realized that he did not have a wayside signal to proceed north at the interlocking. He was, however, moving too fast to stop before passing the signal, indicating he could sh he should stop clear of the main track on which number 94 was approaching. Had Gates reacted either to an approach signal instructing him to reduce speed, or to the stop signal itself in a timely fashion, or had the brakeman called out the state of signals that he, as he was supposed to do, it was likely the Conrail locomotives could have stopped short of the switch. The Conrail locomotives came to a stop on the track directly in front of 94, which approached the interlocking at a speed between 120 to 125 miles per hour. Although the maximum allowed speed for Amtrak AEM-7 locomotives carrying cars on this corridor was 125, 94 was carrying one heritage-style passenger car, whose maximum allowed speed was limited to 105 miles per hour. With little time to react, Amtrak engineer Evans apparently saw the diesels on the line in front of him and applied the brakes for emergency stop. The NTSB determined that even if 94 had been traveling 105 miles per hour, the Amtrak's authorized speed limit, the collision was unavoidable at this point.
On impact, the rearmost Conrail diesel GE P36-7 5045 exploded and burned down to the frame, completely destroying the unit. The middle unit 5052 sustained significant damage to the front, while lead unit 5044 had little damage. One of Amtrak's AEM-7s 900 was buried under the wreckage, while lead locomotive 903 ended up among some trees on the west side of the right-of-way. Several Bud Company Amfleet cars were piled up, and with some crushed under the pile. Cromwell, who was the lead locomotive with Gates, suffered a broken leg in the collision. Gates was uninjured. The Amtrak engineer, lounge car lead service attendant, and 14 passengers were killed. The front cars of the Amtrak 94 train suffered the greatest extent of damage and were almost completely crushed. However, they were nearly empty, awaiting additional holiday passengers en route who would have aborted the train at stations further north. According to the NTSB, had these cars been fully occupied at the time, the death toll would have been at least 100. There are relatively few passengers on those cars, however, and so the death toll was much less. Most of the dead were on Amtrak car 21236. With a total passenger load of about 600 people, there's a great deal of confusion after the collision. Witnesses and neighbors ran to the smoking train and helped remove injured and dazed passengers even before the first emergency vehicles could arri arrive at the location. While many of the injured passengers were aided by nearby residents, some of the uninjured passengers wandered away, making it difficult for Amtrak to know the complete story. Emergency personnel worked for many hours in the frigid cold to extradate trapped passengers from the wreckage, impeded by the stainless steel Amfleet cars skin resistant to ordinary hydraulic rescue tools. Helicopters and ambulances transported injured people to hospitals and trauma centers. It was over 10 hours after the collision before the last trapped people were freed from the wreckage. It was several days before the wrecked equipment was removed and the track and electrical propulsion system was returned to service. Conrail Diesel GEP 36-7-5045 was completely destroyed, while 5044 and 5052 were repaired and returned to service. Both Amtrak's AEM-7s and a few Amfleet cars were also destroyed in the collision. Gates and Cromwell initially denied smoking cannabis, however they later tested positive for the substance. An NTSB investigation revealed that had Gates slowed down the signals as required, he would have stopped in time. It was also determined that Gates and Cromwell's cannabis use was the probable cause of the accident. Gates and Cromwell were immediately suspended by Conrail pending an internal investigation, but resigned ra rather than face certain termination. Gates was eventually charged with manslaughter by locomotive. Under Maryland law, a locomotive is considered a motor vehicle. Prosecutors cut a deal with Cromwell in which he agreed to testify against Gates in, f in return for immunity. Gates was sentenced to five years in state prison and one year probation, and was later sentenced to additional three years on federal charges for lying to the NTSB. Gates' history of DUI, or driving while intoxicated convictions, as well as his admission that the crew had been using cannabis while on duty led for a call to certify locomotive engineers as to their qualifications and history. Taxicology tests on the Amtrak's engineer body returned negative. In a 3-2 decision, the NTSB report stated that the speed of train 94 at the time the brakes were applied was between 120 and 125 miles per hour, was an unauthorized excessive speed since the maximum for an Amtrak train carrying heritage cars was 105 miles per hour. The excessive speed was determined to have been a contributing factor to the amount of damage to both trains at the point of impact. The two disinters to the report believed that it was unreasonable f to assign contributory blame to the Amtrak engineer based solely on the presence of the Am heritage car lowering its speed limit. Gates was released from prison in 1992 after serving four years, two years of state sentence, then two more years of federal sentence and then worked as an abuse counselor at a treatment center. 
In a 1993 interview with the Baltimore Sun, Gates said that the accident would have never happened if not for the cannabis, saying that it threw off his perception of speed and distance and time. He admitted that in a rush to get back to Baltimore and get high, he skipped critical safety checks. He believed that he performed those checks. I wouldn't have been in front of that train. He also revealed that he smoked cannabis on the job several times. Additionally, it was never determined whether the alerter whistle was muted while the locomotives were at Bayview Yard. The alerter whistle on these locomotives were notorious for being irritating and loud, which was pointed out in a 1979 accident of a Union Pacific train in Wyoming which involved muting the whistle with a rag. The whistle was easily accessible by removing a cover on the back of the control stand that was sealed with latches. So, it was possible for the Conrail crew to have muted the whistle before they left or before the units arrived at Bayview Yard, which would have been done by other crews. But Gates reported that the whistle was relatively faint when it was tested, which meant it could not be heard over the sound of the trailing units. The whistle was so well muted that when it went, was sent to the FBI, they were not able to determine when and who muted it because of the lack of fingerprints. When Conrail Lock Unit 5044 was tested after the accident, it was found that old light bulbs, including a replacement for a missing one, were working, and it was undetermined whether the light bulb was removed while Conrail and Amtrak left the units unattended. Gates recalled having tested the cab signaling and seeing all the aspects, but he might have not looked at all the lights. The dead men's pedal was also found to be disabled, while Gates was trying to reactivate the cab signaling system by switching it on and off in the nose of the locomotive. This was despite the cab signaling and dead men's pedal level being different in aspect. The data recorder found that the reverser was put into the reverse position two hours after the accident, and the locomotive's fuses, battery, and engine switched off. As a result of the wreck, all locomotives operating on the Northeast Corridor are now required to have automatic cab signaling while an automatic train stop figure. Although common on passenger trains, until that time, cab signals combined with tr a train stop and speed control had never been installed on freight locomotives due to the potential of train handling issues at high speed. Conrail subsequently developed a device called a Locomotive Speed Limiter, or LSL, a computerized device that is designed to monitor and control the rate of decelerization for restrictive signals in conjunction with cab signals. All freight locomotives which operate in the Northeast Corridor must now be equipped with an operating LSL, which also limits top speed to 50 miles per hour. Previously, freight locomotives were only required to have automatic cab signals without an automatic train stop feature. Also, as a direct result of this collision, federal legislation was also reenacted that required the FRA to develop a system of federal certification for locomotive engineers. These regulations went into effect in January 1990. Since then, railroads are required by law to certify that their engineers are properly trained and qualified, and that they have no drug or alcohol impairment motor vehicle convictions for the five-year period prior to certification. Another effect was that H-Old Ru G, the use of intoxicants or narcotics by employees subject to duty or their position to, or use in while in duty, is prohibited was revamped to, employees are prohibited from engaging in the following activities while on duty or reporting for duty, using alcoholic beverages for or intoxicants, having them in their position or being under the influence, using or being under the influence of any drug, medication, or other controlled substance including prescribed medication that will in any way advertisedly affect their alertness, coordination, reaction, response, or safety. Employees having questions about possible adverse effects of prescribed medication must consult a company medical officer before reporting to duty. And illegally possessing or selling a drug, narcotic, or other controlled substance. An employee may, may be required to take a breath test and or provide a urine sample if the company reasonably suspects violation of this rule. You fool Refusal to comply with this requirement will be considered a violation of this rule and the employee will be rapidly removed from service. 
A form of Ru Ji had existed in many railroad operating manuals for decades. However, the federal coordination for this rule was deemed necessary to determine that the any validator that would be dealt with in a consistent and harsh manner. Also, anyone who passed the stop signal loses his or her FRA certification for a period not less than 30 days for a first offense. This is per 49 CFR Part 240. In 1991, prompted in large by the Chase crash, Congress authorized mandatory random drug testing for all employees in safety-sensitive jobs in industries regulated by DOT. Ten years after the collision, the McDonald School of Owings Mills, Maryland, decided to build a 448-seat theater in memory of one of the crash victims at Illumium. 16-year-old Ceres Millicent Horn, daughter of American mathematicians Roger and Susan Horn. Ceres Horn graduated from McDonald at school at age 15 and enrolled and was accepted at Princeton University at age 16 where she majored in astrophysics. On January 4, 2007, the 20th anniversary of the crash, her family visited the theater for the first time and attended a ceremony at the McDonald School held in honor of of her daughter. The Baltimore County Fire Department medical commander at the scene 20 years later earlier told the newspaper that the Amtrak crash is still being used as a case study in effective disaster response. The reason is how the members of the professional and volunteer fire departments and the community people got together. It was, he said, a very sad but very proud moment in his career.